Okay, so this is obviously a huge topic. So I'm focusing particularly on uh, 1800 to 1920 British board games. Uh, so, and I'm going to do a kind of whistle stop tour looking at various examples uh, of a handful of games that hopefully can be used as ciphers for broader topics. So I'm going to start with moral and religious games. Uh, these were hugely popular in the early 1800s. And in terms of games being used to promote particular ideologies, they're the, perhaps the most blatant. Uh, so this is The New Game of Human Life, uh, which was published in just before the time period, 1790, by uh, John Wallace, the uh, aforementioned ancestor, and, uh, and Elizabeth Newbery. So this is a moral race game. So I'll quickly explain what a race game is. So most of the games we'll see are race games. Uh, they're very basic, uh, aiming to get to the finish before the other players. Think kind of snakes and ladders. Uh, certain spaces you land on may ever help or hinder your progress. So, this game is subtitled, Being the most agreeable and rational recreation ever invented for youth of both sexes. So if you think advertising now is over the top, <laughs> go back to about 1800 and you'll really see it ramped up. Uh, so it's played uh, as a journey through life from uh, year one to 84. The age of man is divided into seven periods of 12 years, infancy to, infancy to youth, manhood, prime of life, sedate middle age, old age, decrepitude, <laughs> and dotage. <laughs> So now, players use a teetotum to progress through life. I think you mentioned before, uh, the weird spinning top is what a teetotum is. Now, uh, the reason this is used is because dice uh, were very much avoided in games like this. Dice had a, had a symbolism with the devil, with vice, with gambling, so they were generally avoided. Um, so they progress through life. Uh, along the way, they encounter a variety of typical situations. The manufacturer describes the advantages of the game like this. If parents who take upon themselves the pleasing task of instructing their children or others to whom that important trust may be delegated will cause them to stop at each character and request their attention to a few moral and judicious observations, explanatory of each character as they proceed and contrast the happiness of virtuous and well-spent life with the fatal consequences arising from vis vicious and immoral pursuits, this game may be rendered the most useful and amusing of any that has hitherto been offered to the public. <laughs> so, there's a, I've tried to cut these down, but I will warn you, there's a few of these very uh, you know, long quotes. They really like them. You can see all of this around is all explaining the game. Uh, and the various, not all of the, uh, so here you go, you start with the infant and you go up to the immortal man. Now it's interesting to say there is a French variety of this game where uh, Voltaire is the man you, you uh, who symbolised it. This doesn't specifically say, but I've got in touch with a few historians, we may have narrowed it down to a couple of, uh, we think he may be a very famous judge at the time, but I'm not sure yet, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, so yes, you're meant to play with a guardian, a parent who will guide you through it, who will explain each of these things. You know, this isn't something you, a child sits down and can play by themselves. These things are very, very wordy. So uh, another one of these uh, types of moral race games is the new game of emulation. So, and also another subtitle. Designed for the amusement of youth of both sexes and calculated to inspire their minds with an abhorrence of vice and love of virtue. Uh, so this was published in 1804 by John Harris. It's another moral race game. So the slip case, which you see, which is what it, uh, the uh, paper would be folded into, um, is a, has a pictorial label showing Apollo and Cupids. Uh, the game itself contains uh, many allegories relating to the world a child may come into contact with. There's a shepherd, a school, a church, bishop, rocking horse. Um, all 66 emblematic figures are designed to teach children to cheerfully exert themselves to obtain an honorary prize uh, <laughs> while being perfectly aware of the consequences of disgrace and naturally dread it. <laughs> <laughs> These games aren't lighthearted. <laughs> Um, feel very sorry for the 19th century children where this was the highlight of their learning experience. <laughs> so the game was advertised as follows. I'm warning you now, this is another long quote, so bear with me. It is used universally acknowledged that a spirit of emulation should be constantly encouraged in the rising generation as the surest means of facilitating their progress in the paths of literature and impressing impre impressing their opening minds with the love of virtue. You are ever anxious for applause and rumination and will <laughs> cheerfully exert themselves to obtain an, an honorary prize, even when admonitions and menaces prove unavailing. 
<laughs> they will be led almost imperceptibly to admire and adopt the virtues of obedience, truth, honesty, gentleness, industry, frugality, forgiveness, carefulness, mercy, and humility, and to view in their real colours the opposite vices of obstinacy, falsehood, robbery, passion, sloth, intemperance, malice, neglect, cruelty, and pride. Right. <laughs> so that's the advert for this. That's the selling point. And what we see here with games of this time, there's the idea that this habituating habit, getting habits into children through play, through repetitive, through reading at them, basically brainwashing them with these kinds of games. So the path to matrimony uh, was published in England in uh, 1893 by an unknown publisher. Uh, it actually has a, compared to a lot of the other games we'll see, has a uh, very plain design. Um, it's a simple spiral race game again, starting at the grace of the, uh, the grave of Venus, sorry, and finishing at the altar. You know, as all relationships go through. Uh, several of the playing spaces are illustrated. Uh, I zoomed in just to get a couple. <laughs> a lot of unintentional humour in 19th century board games. <laughs> so the illustrations are all to do with progress of a courtship leading or not as the case may be to marriage. Uh, so the examples include salute leading to smiles uh, for forward movement uh, and unworthiness leading to rejection and, <laughs> and going backwards. Um, Games like this, very quickly, I'm going to very quickly try and bring up some topics. So gender, uh, history of gender is a huge thing. Games like this are a huge insight to how gender roles are viewed. I mean, here we have uh, the game, uh, as with most games this time, the pronouns used for players are he, they're a man, you expect to be a boy. Although a lot of these games were designed, as we've heard, for youth of both sexes. Um, but modesty is always represented as a woman. Flirtatiousness is always represented as a woman. Um, Despair is apparently uh, leading to the path of matrimony, and hopefully, you know, it won't end up like that. Okay, so educational games. Uh, this is uh, Science and Sport, or the Pleasures of Astronomy. This was published in 1815, again by, uh, oh, by Edward Wallace this time. Uh, the board game is a reissue of a race game first published by John Wallace in 1804. The 35 playing spaces have portraits of astronomers, representations of astronomical phenomena, uh, in addition uh, to facts about the nine known planets and their orbits. The game also features uh, fiction, the man and the moon, uh, signs of the zodiac, comets, rainbows and behaviour, which is interesting. Uh, so uh, you have the studious boy and the blockhead uh, are spaces on this, uh, showing still a connection between the pursuit of uh, natural philosophy, the kind of precursor to science, as it were, um, and astronomy with good character and strong morals. Uh, so these games are often played. So again, you have all the representations or the pictorial representation on the board, then you have a big booklet, and uh, the booklet explains each of these. And so a favourite of mine is from The Man on the Moon, which is number 15. You can see him just up there. And so uh, in the booklet it says this... Um, it is the ridiculous idea of some ignorant people that there is a man in the moon with a dog and a bundle of wood who causes the different appearances of it by eating it away while they say it grows again every month. That you may know better, go back to number 13 and read to yourself the description you find there. <laughs> Very earnest. Um, Again, uh, something quickly of note, in the description, in the booklet, uh, the sun is masculine, still referred to as he, uh, the moon is feminine, it's she, it's her. So again, uh, interesting, just, uh, just little insights that these games can give us. So just very quickly, this is McDowell's musical game. This is a very rare example of uh, a game aimed for young ladies, purely referred to uh, the players as women, and this is because at the time, uh, learning music was very much a feminine pursuit. It's, uh, it wasn't seen as a masculine thing to do. It's very much a thing for young ladies to learn to play the piano, and so games like this would help them. Um, right. I've been rushing a bit because I really wanted to get to this. Now, as a historian, when you go into an archive, every now and again you'll see something and you'll just be jackpot. <laughs> oh, this is... This is perfect. Okay, so this is Wallace's new game of Universal History and Chronology, uh, published in 1814 uh, by John Wallace. Uh, so this is a race game designed to teach history. There are 138 playing spaces numbered in a clockwise direction. The starting point is Adam and Eve. The first 75 spaces deal with events before 1066. 
again, judging time there on a very British scale. Um, each has a date starting of Anno Mundi 1. In the centre is George, that figure, right of centre, gold, you know, virtually a halo around him. So that's George, the Prince Regent at the time, uh, soon to be George IV. Uh, the accompanying booklet has a list of, uh, of all the spaces with their titles and dates. Some have additional information, uh, some have instructions on rewards and forfeits, so things like this is the Battle of So-and-so. Name three generals that died. And, you know, really fun stuff like that. Uh, really wants to get the kids learning um, visually. So this is the beginning. There goes Adam and Eve, beginning there. So, yeah, the way that a society portrays history often gives you a fantastic insight into how that society thinks of themselves. Uh, so this game is just symbolically is, uh, is wonderful for how Britain at the time viewed itself. Um, so it's, uh, remember that this is the universal game of history. Yeah, it starts with the Bible, it goes on to classical history, and then it goes on to almost purely British history, with a few smatterings of European history in there, you know, just to keep it universal. Um, <laughs> just the fact that everything snakes round to the Prince Regent here, a symbol for Britain at that time. Um, you know, I could spend hours and hours just dissecting this game alone, but I'm very aware that I have to move on. Um, so, and, uh, other games that were hugely important in this century and uh, around the turn of the century were travel games, uh, often focused on Asia, on India, on the empire. Now, this is where you get uh, colonialism and uh, empire rearing its head and getting into everything like it did. So, uh, this game over here is the noble game of elephant and castle or travelling in Asia. So, this is published in 1822 by William Darton. Uh, the game stresses learning through reading as the booklet has 84 pages of text <laughs> to accompany the 24 compartments. So, if you think kind of, I don't know, modern video games where you go, you have to read about like the law is bad, try playing these games. Um, so, and it has information covering Asian customs, events, persons of note. Uh, the purpose of the game is set out in its subtitle is to combine amusement with instruction for youth of both sexes. This idea of uh, habituating, of uh, creating habits of learning is somehow is constant throughout the century. Uh, so, actually, one thing, inside the instruction booklet for this game, uh, I found a poem that came in it, and it felt like a very Jumanji moment. I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting this, and I thought I was going to get sucked into the game. But... Um, <laughs> But it's actually really good at demonstrating the uncomfortable relationship between educational board games at this time and gambling. Like we said before, teetotums were used to avoid dice. Uh, so just a little uh, snippet from this poem, which is called The Caution or A Friendly Hint. Uh, <laughs> in the play, there is something to learn. Improvement with mirth is designed. And least we can do for such care, while moral sinks deep in the mind, is to play its rules open and fair, the gambler all hate and despise, for he plays to cheat and to gain, but we to be better and wise, and neither to cause nor feel pain. So that's just uh, the high, lofty moral <laughs> upstanding that these games will obviously give you. Um, so the writing and descriptions in the booklet make for, as you might imagine, very uncomfortable reading uh, now because of obviously hugely racist tones of superiority and uh, kind of as to be expected from this time talking about these issues. Um, on the bottom, as you might be able to pick out there, are uh, portraits of various races, each showing characteristics, and the booklet goes into more detail about them. Um, oh, wow, I'm going to have to really hurry up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I thought the ending paragraph of the booklet for this summed just the tone up wonderfully. It says, but I conjecture there is not one of the company now present who prefers these eastern scenes to the beauties of old England. But who would prefer the society of all, or any of the great folks we have met in the course of our uh, peregrinations, to the easy and honest civility of John Bull and his snug family party and domestic comforts? Yeah, these, uh, these games are just, just so telling of how Britain viewed itself at this time. This idea of the other, of exploring, but at the end of it all, of superiority, as, as we all know with the empire. I'm gonna have to skip through very quickly. Okay, this is Happy Families. <laughs> so this is, this is just to quickly acknowledge that uh, games made purely for amusement can still show us little things. Uh, basically, it's made for just for amusement. 
but this tells you huge things about familial relationships and gender politics at the time, basically. Uh, war games. War games were a thing. <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, very popular in the 19th century, focusing on kings, knights, recreating great battles. Uh, became huge during World War One with these two games often uh, having you fighting as the allies against Germany. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay, so an increase in games influenced by war. Uh, also in the early 20th century, we saw an uh, increase in board games being used directly to address political issues. Uh, the board games produced and distribu distributed by the suffragettes are perhaps the best example of this. Fortunately, I couldn't get pictures because of copyright reasons, but Panker Squiff and Suffragettes in and out of jail were both race games made to promote the cause of women's suffrage, and it was used, uh, used as a medium to demonstrate the difficulties of being a suffragette. So... Hopefully, this very brief, very panicked overview, <laughs> I've managed to show uh, how multiple disciplines of history can be explored in board games. Uh, they should never be purely put in the box of history of childhood, uh, because they also address history of leather, of gender, politics, religion, you know, just to name a few. Uh, they're also material objects, they're things. So to explore these, uh, these themes through an object, when the printed word is often dominated, how we view this period is hugely important. Uh, as objects, they're a mixture of design, of art, of words, but most importantly, play. Uh, never lose the play aspect of these things. The fact that these are only half the things that make it, the people playing it are the other half. Uh, it's a hugely important facet of games. Right. Very briefly, last point. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so as we know, nothing is created in a vacuum. Your surroundings feed into whatever you create. The fact that these board games were rarely published to be a commentary uh, perhaps, make them e perhaps makes them even more valuable. They can be used as windows uh, of un to understand the society that produced them. So I'm aware I'm uh, talking to an audience of a lot of game designers here, so I'm going to leave you with the slight existential crisis uh, that no matter how abstract you think your game might be, uh, one day a very rushed historian may be standing up and using your game as an example of a product of its time. Thank you. Okay, two questions right in the front, straight away. Have you played any? I've tried. They're very bad games. <laughs> <laughs> they are, you know, if you think Monopoly and Snakes and Ladders and stuff are boring, play these games. However, I would really like to get a group of people to play them just to see their reactions to, yes, some of the descriptions in them, but yeah. Uh, the V&A, actually, about 20 years ago, did a bunch of replicas of games from the early 1800s or so. You can still pick them up reasonably cheaply and play them if you must. I, I have one and it's not very, it really isn't. Uh, anyone else? Uh, oh, right in the front. I guess to follow up on that question, what what does the way that the players are told to interact in these games tell you about the time? So you could obviously just look at the components and get a sense of the culture and the history, but what, what kind of behaviours were popular? Uh, so, uh, just from the educational games, uh, Passivity. You're passive in this. You're learning something. Often there is a, a you're meant to have a guardian playing it with you who will tell you, basically play the game for you, and you <laughs> learn it. And um, ideas are so you know politics have always been explored through games, but now I think we're getting to the point where mechanic-wise, you know, actually learning through different mechanics is becoming prevalent. That didn't really exist. So yes, passive basically, very much a paternalistic view of an education. <laughs> Thank you.